Hello, everybody, and welcome to another of my podcasts, um, What Makes You Click. And I'm really pleased today to be joined by uh, James Sapel from, well, he's actually from the UK originally, but um, are you an American citizen now, James? No, I'm not. I'm still no. a permanent resident. Good. Good. Uh, that's nice to know that you've kept your British bit. <laughs> James is the Mary, Mar Mary or Marie, a more mm -hmm. professor of animal ethics and welfare at the School of Veterinary Medicine in Pennsylvania. Um, he... Did his well? Did you do your PhD in parrots? Did I imagine that? Did you... No, that's correct. I that's did true. A okay. PhD on parrots at the University of Liverpool. Yeah. Um, so we might end up talking about parrots. Who knows? Mm. Um, but the, I got to know James a long time ago in the nineties. I'm not sure when you. When did you leave Cambridge? Uh, I left in ninety three. Okay. So, which means that I've known you for 30 years which is um, or followed you for 30 years um and this is this is the book that uh, which is this always works really well when on the audio podcast because people have a clue what i'm talking about in the company of animals um which was a, just an amazing book uh, and i remember reading it and just thinking so it came out in 86 which is just as that well i was in vet school at that time and um i thought I just found it fascinating, the different perspectives on animals. So we're, we're going to talk about that. So in the Company of Animals, you have revised it, or I've never, I've not read the Yeah, it was edition. revised, I think, in um, 2000. Um, and um, it probably, <laughs> probably desperately in need of being revised again. Yeah, well, let, let, we'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing, which if uh, if James's name sounds familiar to you, but you're not entirely sure, Seabark was the other thing that <laughs> I think a lot of people will know you for, uh, profiling right. of dogs, and we'll, we'll probably get to chat about that. Um, James published over 200 books and papers, etc. cetera. Um, and um, anyway, so yeah. So uh, a real pioneer in the field of companion uh, human animal interactions and um, and various perspectives. So I'm looking forward to this chat because it's been a little while. Although we've 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 sort of been in a couple of meetings and exchanged, you know, you've put people in touch with me um, recently. It's just nice to be able to catch up with you um, again. So welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, and as I said, the, this book in the company of animals, it just I. Well, I still think it is such a great book and it's so easy to read. And I guess sort of my first question is, how on earth did you get the idea to write about this? Because as I said, your PhD was in parrots. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was so, I mean, you must have started it in early 80s and it's so well, different. Yeah. Um, actually, there's sort of the... Um... The book was conceived very early in, in my final year of my undergraduate degree at um, University College London. I did a course at somewhere called the Institute of Archaeology um, in London on the domestication of plants and animals. I was doing a zoology degree, but the University of London is one of these wonderful places, which in the old days you could you could cross over to all these different colleges and do different courses. So the last the, the last podcast I did was with Clive Wynn and he did UCL oh. and he did human studies and he said exactly the same. You could just, as long as you could justify it had something to do with humans, you could yep. take any course you liked, which is a brilliant degree. And we yeah. need more like that, I think, especially. Yeah, it was very nice, very eclectic. And yeah. the Institute of Archaeology was pretty much across the road from um, UCL. So I, I would pop over there and, and talk to all these wonderful uh, archaeologists, zoo archaeologists, people like um, Juliet Cluttenbrock, who became a very good friend, and Peter Rocco and people like that, who taught on the course. And they, at the end of the course, we had to do a, a project, an honors project. And my honors project was on the domestication of the dog. Um, so, because I just became intrigued by that whole topic. Mm. And um, at the time, there was a theory in circulation that uh, that had this sort of idea that people, that the dog might have been domesticated through pet keeping practices among sort of early hunter gatherers. And I thought, wow, that's such an interesting idea that hunter gatherers might keep pets, because 
at that time, really, pet keeping, it wasn't exactly disparaged, but it was kind of seen as a bit of trivia. Mm. Um, even though millions of people were doing it, uh, it was perceived as being a bit of a joke. Well, working with dogs were... just wasn't considered biological right. research. It wasn't real. Yeah. It, these weren't yeah. real animals. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and so I kind of thought, well, I, I'm going to go and do some reading around this whole topic of pet keeping. And I came across this awful book um, called Petishism. And the subtitle was Pet Cults of the Western World. It was written sometime in the 70s or 80s. And um, it was basically <laughs> this diatribe against pet keeping, describing pet keeping as a kind of horrific pathology that had gripped the Western world and um, was undermining kind of <laughs> human integrity in various bizarre ways. And I read this book and I thought, my God, this is awful. And I, you know, I thought, you know, I can't believe the pet keeping is so pernicious. I can't believe that, you know, you know, having been steeped in evolutionary theory from an early age, I, I could not believe that um, so many people would indulge in, in, in this activity. It was so detrimental to our well-being. So that, that sort of got me going. But then at that point, um, I, I kind of I kind of lost the plot a bit and um, I got diverted into this interest in parrots. And um, I ended up doing this PhD on parrots um, at the University of Liverpool. And um, then when that came to an end, I decided there was no future in parrot research. <laughs> um, so I kind of dug out this topic of pet keeping again, which had been sort of in the back of my As if that's got a big future because nobody was interested <laughs> in it. <laughs> but, um, and I then went, uh, I kind of marched off to Cambridge, obviously thinking big at this point and said um, uh, to Pat Bateson, uh, Patrick Bateson, who was then at the sub department of animal behavior, I said, um, I want to do this research on why people keep pets. And um, he kind of, he looked at me and then said, well, you better, you better go and talk to Nick Humphrey. And uh, Nick Humphrey at that time was a, a lecturer in the zoology department, uh, primarily a psychologist. But he had, the week before, had been approached by Simon from Pedigree Pet Foods saying they wanted to sponsor research on human pet relationships. Oh, wow. and so I literally came a week later saying, I want to do research on human pet relationships. So Nick Humphrey said, well, you better get in touch with this chap at, um, at Pedigree Pet Foods, uh, who was Peter Messant. Um, I don't know if you ever met Peter. No, I, 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 I sort of know the name, but yeah. Yeah, he's now uh, retired and living mm -hmm. in Suffolk somewhere, but um, he, he um, he and I got together and we talked about the project and I kind of, one thing led to another and I got finished up with a postdoc at the sub department of animal behavior in Cambridge, studying human pet relationships. And uh, you know, <laughs> the rest is history. So. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Cause I mean, that's the thing chat, doing these chats with people is just sort of, yeah. How often something just turns on a pure coincidence and I remember Ben Hart saying he was literally walking down the corridor yeah. with somebody you know and they just happened happened to bump into this person who wanted to give a big legacy to Davis in this field and just thought right. okay fair enough you know otherwise they wouldn't have taken off the animal behavior clinic at Davis and you just think oh <laughs> you know yeah it's but, absolutely yeah. right it's um so um so I mean, so, so yeah, so you, I mean, it's so eclectic, this book, because you know, as I said, the, the diverse areas that you came to. So, I mean, how did you manage to, yeah, you know, spread your, yourself so wide to think about it in such a broad way, you know? Well, it started off as it was just going to be a book about why people keep pets. And, um, and I, I sort of drafted a couple of chapters and I, showed them to um, a kind of literary friend of mine who at that time was editor of a magazine called The Granter uh, in Cambridge, a sort of literary magazine. And um, he, he read them and <laughs> sent them back and he said, 
you know, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but this is just boring, he said. Um, <laughs> you need to, well, first of all, you need to stop writing like a scientist. And, and secondly, you have to, you know, that there has to be a more interesting peg to hang this all on. And um, so I went away and cogitated and thought about it and then realized really that you couldn't really talk about people's relationships with companion animals without considering also the sorts of relationships we have with other animals, which are so different. And so, uh, you know, almost diametrically the opposite, you know, we, we tend to distance ourselves emotionally from most other animals because we use them for horrible things like eating them and using them for research and other stuff like that. So that then became the primary theme of the book, but there's sort of the, the intro into a consideration of pet ownership and what pet ownership means to people and how people relate to animals in that very sort of uh, intimate uh, uh, way um, contrasts with this other way of regarding animals. And that's, that's really how the book developed uh, to uh, some much broader consideration, but it was, it was, a, you know, it did cover a lot of ground and much of it very superficially, you know, which at the, you know, now I look back on it and I feel, ooh, you know, here you are sort of speculating wildly about stuff, you know, very little about, but. They're great uh, ideas, you know, and that's the thing. Yeah. They are testable ideas, a lot of them. A lot of them are. And um, actually most of my career since then has been <laughs> kind of focused on testing those various yeah. ideas. Yeah, which is, I mean, well, and I think that's the thing, you know, it's, there's, there's so much now, which is just so conservative, you know, you're not allowed to. And if I, if I looked, when I looked at your Google Scholar account, and I just looked at the number of citations your papers have, and you, you've got a really large number of papers with very high citation rates. So, you, you know, yeah, you, you do these things, which really, I think that, what that indicates is that makes people think. And perhaps anybody who's sort of, I say, young, the next generation, they probably don't realize that in yeah the 1980s to try and do work on dogs was virtually impossible if it wasn't dog health veterinary type work. Yeah. Um, as I said, even then, it's difficult. I mean, I, I sort of started kicking things, doing my stuff in the 1990s, and people were just sort of, well, yeah, dogs aren't real animals. That's not real biology research. And, you know, that is a, it's a very different story now. But you must have had a lot of knockbacks in, in trying to publish your work. In, I mean, I guess maybe, do you think being at Cambridge made it easier if you've got people like, Nick Humphrey and Pat Bates and behind you, I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm sure it was brilliant work, but it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Brilliant work can get rejected simply because it doesn't fit with the mindset at the time. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I think it's probably quite likely that being having a sort of sub-department of animal behavior address helped. Um, but um, I wouldn't say I had that much trouble publishing stuff. I had tremendous trouble getting funding for research. Mm. I mean, I, frankly, if it hadn't been for the Mars Corporation for Pedigree Pet Foods, I probably never would have, you know, succeeded at all mm. because they were very supportive in my early years, even though a lot of the research I did early on was pretty feeble. Um, they, they were <laughs> very charitable and very understanding and continued to support me for, for a good part of a decade, I would say. Mm. Um, and um, without that, I think it would have been very, very difficult to have sort of establish a career in this field. But that, but you know, I think with any field, you know, it starts off with the, the research may not be that high tech because you know we're still exploring ideas and we haven't necessarily got the right paradigms in in place. But that's that's science. And again, again, and you know, I think this is um, this is the thing. You know, people have people's idea of what science is and what it isn't you know it's only dealing with uncertainty and if we can reduce that uncertainty it's science you know <laughs> that's that's all we're trying to do we're not trying to um prove our point um and, yeah. you know and whereas people want these absolute certainties and you think well that's not what science is about science you know that's what belief is about <laughs> your absolute yeah. certainties yeah um no, i agree but um but anyway so um as I said, it, it was a book that had an enormous, as I said, it, to me, and um, 
I, as I said, I've, I really enjoyed the book. If, if nobody's read that, and you say that it's, yeah, it was revised in 2000, whether or not it, you get round to doing an, an, another edition as well. Um, because I have to confess, I haven't read the revised edition. <laughs> How much changed? Should I go and buy the revised edition or not? It, it hasn't changed that much. It's just sort of expanded where it needed expansion, you know. Yeah. Mm. So it sounds like you've got somebody texting you. I think it's your phone, not mine, isn't it? I'm, I'm trying, I tried to switch it off, but it seems to be coming through on my computer. Oh. Oh. Um, uh, so, so, I mean, one of the things which, um, you know, that has really grown as well, and I know you've done obviously a, a lot of work um, in that area is pets and human health. And this, um, and I, I must do one of these podcasts with Hal Herzog, although I don't really know him very well. I, I'd, I'd love to, <laughs> he's somebody I'd love to chat to and I, I, I might uh, reach out to him and see if I can do one. And there's a paper where he's just done a blog yesterday or whatever about a paper that is <laughs> that has apparently has been accepted. So it's not even published um, by Megan uh, Muller and co at Tufts. And basically what they did is they took a group of teenagers um, and gave them sort of stressful educational tests. They had to do like a maths test and uh, prepare a talk and stuff like that. And they had them in, um, they either had a handler with a dog, handler with a stuffed dog or uh, nothing there. And they found that the there was no benefit from actually the live dog. Um, and it was interesting, actually, because I was reading the blog earlier and Hal points out that just to give people an idea. In 1990, there were 19 papers are published published on pets and human health. In 2020, there were 698. <laughs> and it gives you an idea just how the field has, has grown. Um, and so with the stuffed dog they were allowed to touch it and whatever and Hal argues that yeah this idea that actually you know maybe dogs aren't providing social support and he talks about the decline effect so you know as the evidence gets better then so ideas that we might have start to get left behind um I don't know if you've got an opinion on that uh, as to whether or not you think that pets and human health I, I Personally, yeah, you know, people make all sorts of claims and I think things are important. Um, and, you know, whether or not it is specific to the pet, but the pet is the vehicle. Um, but, you know, what, what's your feeling at the moment uh, with regards to the, what the benefits of pets are as far as human health go and where they might come from? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to speak to the, the Megan Mueller paper you know if i was going to pick a group that i would least expect to show effects of uh, uh pets on human health i would pick adolescents um mm. so it doesn't surprise me that they weren't there wasn't really much effect there okay. um but um i think the issue really is that there was this expectation early on that there would be uh, some sort of magical effect of pets uh that that and the way people talk about it often, it, it, they talk about it in magical terms as though the animal has some sort of miraculous ability to break through barriers um, and, uh, and affect people emotionally in ways that um, uh, human focused therapies and so forth or human interpersonal interactions can't affect people. And I think the danger with that is that then you you know you're setting people's expectations very high, and um, I think the reality is that uh, these animals clearly do have an impact on people, um, and we can see that you know in terms of the sort of neuroendocrine responses uh, to these types of interactions. But it probably depends a lot on the animal and how the animal interacts with us. Um, we you know know from multiple studies now that you know in human interactions being looked at being gazed at looking into uh, each other's eyes it sends a specific type of signal and lo and behold when we look at these pets the ones that people are particularly fond of those animals also <laughs> look at us all the time they're looking into our eyes they're giving us these adoring looks and um so it's not 
to me, wholly surprising to find that people respond to that. Um, you know, but I, th uh, but I think I it also depends very much on the person as well. And again, of course, yeah, and this absolutely. Is, and again, this is this is this is an area which I'm sort of increasingly interested in. Is that you know people are designing these studies and say, oh well, you've got to randomize. Well, if actually you know those sorts of designs of experiments work very well with simple interventions. Mm -hmm. An animal is not a simple intervention, <laughs> you know, it can have so many different effects on different people. Yeah. Um, and to just think about it in terms of, well, here we do, we do our randomization, we allocate them to these groups and we take them, and, um, you know, and, and OK, they matched the teenagers on their anxiety levels. But I, I don't I haven't seen the paper, so I don't know whether or not they matched them on whether or not they liked dogs. You know. Right. Um, and again, if you've got a lot of people who don't particularly get on with dogs or don't feel that dogs add a lot to their life, then I wouldn't expect the dog to add much to them. Right. Um, all, all these studies that show, you know, if you look at the uh, <laughs> distribution of pet ownership across the life stage, you know, it goes up in childhood, but then it drops dramatically during adolescence because adolescents are interested in other stuff. You know, they're interested in stuff yeah. outside the home and away from the family. And then it starts to pick up again in middle age and then drops off among the elderly again. And so, you know, <laughs> again, we, you know, there's a big focus, for example, on pets and the elderly and how important pets are for the elderly. But you have to bear in mind that, you know, I'm getting into that bracket of being elderly. And I can, for me, a lot of my pets are more of a burden than a <laughs> pleasure. Because I want to, you know, in my declining years, I want to go off and travel and do interesting things, of course, with COVID, I can't do that. But <laughs> assuming things return to normal, you know, I, 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 I don't actually want any more pets for a while. Maybe when I settle down finally and decide I've had enough of travel, but yeah. you know, I'm still reasonably fit and hale and hearty and I want to do stuff. And pets are well, a thing. They if hold I, you down. Yeah, if I, if I get a dog now, I'm looking at it going into my seventies. Yeah, think, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, not sure. At, at, yeah, you know, that sort of level of commitment. It, it's interesting. Um, a number of years ago, I had a PhD student. And, yeah, and we looked at um, people and their getting dogs and dog ownership. And when we looked at the elderly, one of the reasons why that we, we looked at people who wanted to get a dog and didn't get a dog. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a real shame. It, uh, it was Claire Brown um, uh, and... Um, she uh, there's, uh, there's actually they've got to be careful because there's several Claire Browns in the field, but um, uh, and she never published any stuff from the PhD. There's some really nice stuff there, but as I said, so she looked at people who wanted to get a dog but didn't get a dog, and there were two groups that sort of stood out. One were the thirty somethings, who were just so busy they didn't fit. They they felt sort of because they liked dogs and they were interested in dogs. They also recognized that they were so busy and it wouldn't be fair on the dog. And mm. then there were the 70 pluses. And, and the th reason that came back from the 70 pluses, which um, surprised me, was they, they were worried what would happen to the dog after they died. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what was holding them back. So in, in both groups, you know, yeah, these people were being, you, you could say, very sensible about it. Um, and yeah, you know, and whilst for some people, yeah, in their 70s, they, you know, and um, thinking about the, the the paper you did on, you know, people's attitudes to pets, and you talk about it in terms of affect and utility. Mm. If somebody sees their relationship with the dog in a very emotional way, then they probably don't think through to the fact that, well, I remember my, my late dad when he got my mum a puppy, and I said, well, you intend to make it to 90 then, dad? <laughs> you know, sort of, because... <laughs> You know, he was, um, and well, my dad did make it to his 90s. So, um, but, you know, but they're responding to that and they probably get a lot of benefit from it in, in that respect. Yeah. But if you're somebody who thinks, yeah, um, sort of perhaps a little less emotionally about those things, then you can still get a lot of pleasure out of your dog doing various things with it, etc. But at the same time, you're perhaps more aware of you have some of the limitations that go with it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there are all these different factors. I mean, like you say, there's the the human 
the human component and how susceptible those individual humans are to the charms of these animals. And, um, and then there's the animal component, which is, is this the type of animal that's going to really trigger that sort of response in a human? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's going to relate to the breed, the, the species, the behavior, all these different uh, things are going to factor into it. And it's, you know, controlling for all those variables is virtually impossible. I think you have to take a, a, a different perspective and say, okay, maybe something more experimental. So we're going to say, we're going to pair, compare a, um, you know, a Siberian Husky with a golden retriever. And we're going to look at how they behave towards people. And um, based on that, we're going to make certain predictions about the effect it's going to have on the person or something like that. Um, that I think will be in the end, end up more be, being more revealing perhaps than um, than these these other kinds of so studies. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I wanted to chat to you about yeah. breeds because I know that you're you know again breeds is a big thing as well in in your uh, research career. But I've got a PhD student at the moment who's looking at um, dog and owner interactions and its potential impact on them psychologically. Mm -hmm. what, what she's done is. Um, She's, she's basically started off by interviewing loads of people and saying, what do you do with your dog and how does it make you feel? Um, and as a result of that, she's got this sort of list of about 60 different activities that seem to have different effects, but you can start to group them and start to make different predictions. Um, interestingly, we've sort of supervised a master's student. We've done it with cats and you get quite a different profile. Um, she's actually originally from Brazil and we had a Brazilian student. So we looked at it amongst the um, Brazilian population as well and got very similar results. As, and this is all qualitative work. But she's also now um, worked with uh, autistic adults mm -hmm. and interviewed them. And whilst you get a lot of the same, there's a number of additional things that seem to be coming out from the um, adults with autism that weren't apparent. And I hope you won't mind me saying this. I've better check. I won't, I won't need to edit it out. One of the things that's come out of the interviews with the autistic um, adults, which um, we didn't come out with the humor is, uh, and it wasn't just one or two, it's quite a high proportion said, my dog stopped me from killing myself. Hmm. You just think, whoa, you know? Um, you know, the stress that these people are under, um, yeah. uh, you know, their dog gives them a reason for being and coping with things. And you think, mm, yeah, OK. Um, and yeah, so we, I think it's, it's, it's that very individualized. And I think, as I said, it depends on. Um, uh, yeah, it depends a lot on the human side and again that's a, been a big theme in your research is the importance of the human in the relationship and problem behavior in animals as well um, yeah. and well maybe we should go there before we go to breeds i don't know or, or think about well they're, they're, they're not entirely separate i think certain types of people get certain breeds of dog as well yeah. um so yeah so in relation to um breeds um I mean, what, what kicked off your interest in, in breeds as well, then? Um, that's a really, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't, I, I think I kind of got, um, I was, at, you know, when I originally developed this questionnaire that's now known as the sea bark, I was interested in, in using it to explore the prevalence of behavior problems in the dog population as a whole. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, you know, questionnaires are easy, cheap, quick mm -hmm. to do. And um, at that point, it looked, I mean, basically all the information about behavior problems was coming from people who were treating animals with behavior problems. And they were giving this idea that, well, it was creating the impression that, you know, some problems were very common in the population and, and this kind of thing. And I, I felt that was probably unlikely that it was, these problems were very common, but basically I wanted to establish how common they were, you know. Mm. And so we created this questionnaire and then when the data started to roll in and we started to see what the prevalence was, you know, it inevitably raised questions about, well, 
is that prevalence equally distributed across gender, you know, sex of dog, across breed of dog, across age of dog, and that kind of thing. And so those kinds of those were the kinds of questions we started to look at. And um, we published one early study that looked at um, uh, differences in aggression based on these questionnaire results among different populations of dogs. Um, and um, we found, you know, some interesting breed differences. And then uh, others have looked to use the same instrument to look at uh, distribution of fear and things like that in different breeds. And, and then, you know, the geneticists got onto it as a phenotyping measure. And they, now they've started to look at the genetics of these different breed differences and, and, and so on. And so it's, um, it's kind of developed out of that. It was a sort of organic. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, so you published that paper fairly recently in the proceedings of the uh, was it Royal Society, wasn't it? The yeah. genetics one. And yes. I, I, to, I, I got to be honest, that was surprising that I, when I saw that, because as I said, I always think of you as sort of the human, the, the role of the human in a lot of these issues and, and sort of, you yeah, know, that genetic side of things. And I know sort of, yeah, geneticists are really keen to find yeah um that, that paper interestingly enough circling back yeah uh, came about as a result of a conversation i had with evan mclean mm. at the canine science forum in lincoln <laughs> which you organized and uh, we we were eating dinner together in a restaurant in lincoln and we started talking about this stuff and he said you know send me the data I'll, we will do this and um that's where it that's oh, where it, wow had its origin my my so i mean and okay we it's sort of we don't get dragged into the nature nurture argument but what are your feelings now with regards to sort of what we can because I, I think i the more i sort of think about breeds i wonder how much of breed typical behavior is self-fulfilling prophecy somebody gets a certain breed they get a retriever they play retrieving games so it becomes a good retriever and actually i think yeah it was I, I think it's in here wasn't it you, you talk about the gamekeeper who had cavalier king charles spaniels or something um i can't remember i've forgotten maybe i'm imagining it but um i, I, I seem to recall one. if it wasn't you it was my dad telling me one of these stories <laughs> but um um but just sort of so the, there was a gamekeeper who yeah decided to do train cavaliers as um game dogs maybe it wasn't you as i said yeah, i thought it was in there but that's like ray carpenter <laughs> um may, maybe yeah may um but yeah so you know yes th th obviously there are differences between breeds genetically and yeah. you know but how much of that yeah, how strong do you think those effects are if all things were equal? Well, I think, um, you know, like all of these things, the, the, the sort of, uh, the phenotype is a mix of genotype and environment. And mm. I think in dogs in particular, the environment's terrifically strong, has a huge impact. So, um, and especially because dogs are so could... focused on people, so how the yeah. owner behaves, you know, probably has so much has much more effect than perhaps on a cat who probably does its own thing regardless of what the owner does. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's true. Um, and also that paper that um, you mentioned, the levels of heritability we got were very high, but you have mm. to remember that they were it, the her heritability estimate was based on breed averages mm. uh, so what what it's saying is that these 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 differences between breeds are highly heritable mm. it doesn't mean that the trait whatever it is is necessarily highly heritable. Uh, okay yeah so if you look okay. within breeds typically behavioral traits have very low heritability yeah. or relatively low mm. heritability um, but when you do this comparison across breeds uh, you find that those differences between breeds are highly heritable. Um, so I guess what that's saying is that yes, um, most dog breeds are the result of selection for particular behavioral predispositions. Um, and that shows up when you do that type of analysis. Uh, but within any breed, you know, you, there's a huge amount of variation. And yeah. um, 
and you, you'll find dogs within that breed who are quite atypical. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they will be, you know, then the question is, is that due to their environment? Is that due to, you know, genetic variation within the breed? You know, it's an open question, yeah. I guess. But I think the environment is, is terribly important, especially the early environment. The early developmental environment is really critical. Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it just sort of sets them on one road or the other, I think, and it's it can be difficult to turn back. So that yeah, because when we looked at impulsivity in dogs, and we looked at um, Labradors versus the Border Collies, we then looked at show lines versus working lines, and working lines, yeah, big differences in impulsivity, as you'd expect. You know, Border Collies quite impulsive, Labradors not very impulsive. Um, show lines virtually identical right and if you think well and and yeah you know i'm not saying it's necessarily genetic but if you've been sort of bred to stand still while somebody gropes you all over and you know then yeah. probably you're actually selecting for a, a particular trait as well and um and yeah it's that variability within a breed um and i i think you know i feel that people still haven't grasped that idea that they um and, you know, as scientists, people often look at that average, but as I'm still a clinician, I'm interested in that individual. So whilst, you, you know, whilst knowing that this dog is from this breed and this breed on average has these traits, well, if the animal is doing something completely different and that's causing its problem, that's still perfectly reasonable explanation for this particular dog, because there are going to be some on those tails of the, the, the distribution. Um, yeah. But um, I was actually asked the other week if I'd review a new book on breed differences in dog behavior. And I said, unfortunately, I hadn't got time. Um, but um, I mean, I think it's, it'd be nice to have a really good book that does talk about breed differences and the complexity of them, yeah. uh, of where they actually come from. Yeah. Um, so, um, but uh, so, um uh, the other th one of the other things we're just circling back actually to the uh, pets and uh, in human health which again you know and i i must confess i hadn't picked up on this but i it's really to me it's become a really buzz topic the last year or two is the welfare of the animal in aai and i actually mm -hmm. saw that y you published on this 20 years ago <laughs> or more and, yeah. I was, and I was thinking oh right okay but it, it seems to have suddenly taken off again and I just, I just wondered what your thoughts were on the ethical issues of animals yeah. in, in AAI at the moment yeah I mean I think um, like all of these uses that we put dogs to you know there's the potential to um ignore the needs of the animal in in order to satisfy the needs of the either the handler or the target group in this case the people who are seeking animal assisted uh, interactions therapy and um, you know there is a tendency out there to view the whole thing as being a, a sort of a very rosy activity a very beneficial activity or for all concerned and i think for many of these dogs actually it is you know that the you know there have been a number of studies that have looked at things like stress hormones and so on in in these dogs when they're doing what they do and for the most part the studies are the results are fairly positive um but there are some indications that you know if you subject the dog to too much of this stuff they begin to show signs of stress. Or if you do it too frequently, they begin to show signs of stress and that kind of thing. And um, you know, I just think there's a, I, well, I, I don't think it, I mean, I know it, I've seen it in practice that a lot of the people who participate in these activities, the dog owners, the dog handlers, um, are so focused on, on you know, the perceived benefits of what they're doing that they kind of ignore I, the dog. And I, the dog is sending signals. You can tell the dog is sending signals that it's 
it's stressed, that it's anxious, that it wants to get out of the situation, but it, it's, you know, it's just too nice a dog to really <laughs> make that, send that message loud enough. And uh, I met somebody, I met somebody a couple of years ago and she did her PhD, she's a vet, and she did her PhD on basically the psychology who, of people who volunteer their dogs and possibly cats, but their dogs as blood donors. Mm -hmm. And it, it was absolutely fascinating chatting to her. I, I can't remember her surname, her first name's Vanessa. Um, I think it begins with an A. I don't know if you've seen any of her work. I don't think so. No, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating because she was saying, you know, the owners are just so focused on this is such a good thing to do. And they're completely mm -hmm. blind to the fact that, you know, they're volunteering their their dog without any permission from their dog to give a good old chunk of blood on a regular basis. But right, right. it's a good thing to do. And right. therefore, you know, um, yeah and sort of yeah they're projecting that the animal is you know has this moral sense as well and you think yeah it's it's interesting um yeah. that people yeah the, how much people see what they want to see in these sorts of things and, and go well beyond you know yeah what the animal um is yeah is capable of thinking and, and you know right. it's, an, it's another level of anthropomorphism i think this sort of yeah. animals can think in it well i presume well uh, i'm assuming that uh, you don't think animals have a, a much of a moral compass do you <laughs> no not really no i mean it's uh, i mean they have a sense of <laughs> i think they have a sense of fairness of some sort but i don't think they have much of a moral compass yeah um they have a maybe, sense of unfairness certainly yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i'm i'm encouraged actually by how much this talk of the welfare of uh, therapy dogs and other therapy animals is beginning to resonate within the, the community, the organizations that engage in this activity. So a lot of them now are developing uh, guidelines and uh, recommendations and so on and so forth to kind of acknowledge that they see this as a potential problem that needs to be addressed. So that, I think that's encouraging that, you know, I think it's a sort of a coming of age kind of thing that uh, these organizations were maybe a bit wild west to begin with and now they're starting to professionalize and they realize that this is an important component. So we published a little paper and I came out just after you published a much bigger paper on a similar topic which was interesting which was about professional standards mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the field and to me it was quite an eye-opener because you know if you want to do education and you claim to be an educationist, you have to be a teacher. Or if you want to do therapy and claim to be a therapist, you have need professional qualifications. But it seemed that as soon as you put the word animal assisted in front of it, you didn't need the human professional qualification. Right. So, you know, you don't you didn't need to have any teaching qualifications to teach people if you were using a dog as the vehicle to mm -hmm. teach kids to read. And you said, whoa you know um and to me that was that was quite an eye-opener and um and what we did find is that those that did have the qualifications so i mean uh, various aspects of their practice were that much more uh, professional but it is it is a bit worrying i think the sort of as you say it's a bit wild west in at times yeah and um it also may, it matters a lot whether people are doing this you know professionally or whether they're just volunteers so in, in the USA, they're all volunteers. Then none of them are doing this professionally. Um, but uh, I know in parts of Europe, it is a kind of profession. And, um, and um, in some countries, at least, they're getting, you know, developing very strict standards. Uh, and, oh, Austria, they have very strict. Your, your dog has to be assessed on an annual basis. You have to do various exams as well. Yep. Yeah, same um, in uh, Sweden, I believe, yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, as I said, this, well, I get the impression there's been a real proliferation in the US in this area, just, just animal assisted activities in its broadest form. I mean, emotional assistance dogs, somebody was telling me that, um, yeah, most assistance dogs, that by far the majority of assistance dogs by the end of the decade will be for PTSD as well. Mm-hmm. 
And I mean, that's not an area I've, I've worked in. I, I don't know if you have and sort of people having these, PTS, these PTSD dogs. And, and again, you know, there's, there's not that much evidence. I mean, clearly, um, you know, I've, I've met people um, suffering from PTSD and they say how important their dog is to them. And, I, you know, there's no reason to doubt that whatsoever. And just because you could might be able to substitute it with something else. Well, why, you know, um, it doesn't have to be dogs um, specific to be valuable, but there just seems to be this massive growth in emotional support animals as well. Mm. But then it's almost as if sort of, well, well, for most people having a dog is emo and provides emotional support in any case, you know, what, yeah. where do you draw the line? And um, exactly. I mean, there was that incident, wasn't there on the airline, was it? Delta Airlines with the dog actually bit somebody and then Delta Airlines got sued as well. Oh, they've had some really bizarre incidents. They had a pig and an emotional sport pig got loose on an <laughs> airplane in, in the US. I forget which airline. And the plane had to make a, an emergency landing because this pig was out of control in the, in the fuselage. <laughs> um, a mini pig, I hope, or was it? <laughs> well, I don't know that it was that many. It was oh, quite... God. It was big enough to <laughs> of require an emergency landing. Oh, jeez. Um, oh, wow. Um, yeah, well. Um, yeah, the whole emotional sport animal area is, again, that is that is real Wild West. Um, so, yeah, exactly. As you said, where do you draw the line? Um, mm. I could I could readily argue that my, my dog or my cat is, is my emotional support. And I can go online and get a letter from some, you know, kind of roadside psychologist saying, oh, yes, James Supple needs this animal to, um, in order to, uh, with him at all times, otherwise, you know, it's going to impair his mental functions. And um, I can use that letter to take my dog on an airplane or wherever I like. And um, the only thing, <laughs> the only thing, that you know people can do is to say to me uh is that you know is that dog been trained to be our emotional support animal and i could say yes and um and then they have to accommodate me and now it's become really crazy because uh, uh they're requiring it of landlords as well to provide accommodation for an animal if the person claims it's an emotional support animal and so then you can have people you know keeping pigs in their houses or um wow. keeping whatever they like and the landlord can't get them out um and it's a it's a big problem we've had um on the university campus we've had students saying they have to have the dog with them in the dorms um uh because it's their emotional support animal and for the most part the universities are complying they, they've just thrown up their hands and given up because otherwise they get slapped with a lawsuit uh from the government so I find that fascinating because, you know, at our place, the thing that comes up again and again is, well, what about people who are phobic of dogs? What about people who are allergic to dogs? Yeah. I mean, you're saying in, in they're keeping these animals in the dorms. They're going to encounter people with one of those other two issues. Yeah. Um, aren't they worried they're going to get sued by those people saying, you've traumatized me? Well, they're trying to, they're trying to kind of, you know, position these students in their dorms surrounded by students who don't have those kinds of issues mm. and are okay with it, but it's creating all sorts of headaches. And universities are being sued. Um, wow. I've had, to, I've had to give evidence in, in cases uh, of universities that are getting sued by students because they weren't allowed to bring their pets to to college with them and and what's been the sort of legal opinion then uh well you're, you're up against um the government because um it's you know you're up against the justice department because this is a, a rule that's in been implemented by you know the department of housing and urban development and so <laughs> if someone decides to sue you they've got the government on their side so it's very difficult for these universities to wow. you know argue against that it's very expensive they've got a higher you know, very expensive lawyers to kind of basically go against the government. And um, so it's a big problem. Wow. So, okay. So um, just <laughs> uh, where do you think this is going to go then? I mean, it's hard to say. I think eventually the rules will be changed because people are definitely abusing mm. 
the rules at the moment, um, especially on air transport and things like that. I know people personally who mm. falsely claimed that their dog was an emotional sport animal and took it on an airplane just because they didn't want to pay to have it shipped. Um, um, so they just took it in the, you know, the passenger compartment with them. And um, <laughs> in the case I'm thinking of, it was a very large dog, very old and very smelly. So it can't have been pleasant for other passengers. Um, so I can remember in Australia once sort of an announcement going out that they had somebody on the plane who had a peanut allergy. So please, if you've got peanut, sand, peanut butter sandwiches, please don't open them because, you know, we could have somebody go into anaphylactic shock. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and that just came through as an announcement. I just wondered, though, you know, if you had somebody who was allergic to dogs on the flight. And I, I don't think um, dog allergies are as severe generally as peanut allergies. But I just wondered if, you know, because is it also true you don't have to declare it beforehand if it's an assistance animal. You can just turn up and they have to accommodate it. Uh, if it's a true assistance animal, for example, a guide dog, yeah, then um, yeah, you're you're pretty safe because the law allows those animals pretty much everywhere. Mm. Uh, but in in that in that case, the animal has clearly been you know trained at length to serve a very specific purpose to help a disabled person, mm. and. Um, and, and that law has been on the statute books for a long time and people have been quite happy with it. But this emotional support animal thing has really thrown the spanner in the works. And in fact, a lot of the guide dog organizations and the assistance dogs organizations are, are lobbying to prevent these emotional support animals being recognized in the same way because they, they think it's going to have a knock-on negative effect mm. for true assistance dogs. Yeah. So it's a very complicated situation. It reminds me of a, a, a story, and I, I don't know whether, I don't know if it's an urban myth or not. I can't remember who told me it, but this sort of goes back to probably the 1980s when you know things were much easier with flights in America. And the story goes that somebody going up the west coast and they were blind and they had their guide dog with them. And you know, as used to happen, you'd go from one city to the next. Um, the plane might stop for a little while. Some people might get off. Some people might stay on and go to the next destination. So you, you know, you have these two or three city stops. Mm. And there was this guy who was blind, and he had his guide dog, and he regularly did this trip. You know, maybe twice a week. You know, he because he was going home or going to work in different parts of the state. And. Um, you know, at the first stop, he'd sometimes take his dog out to let it have a pee or something like that. <laughs> the story goes that sort of, and I said, I don't know if it's an urban myth, but um, I just wish I could remember who told me, but sort of he was well known by the crew because they often did the same flight or whatever. They get to the first stop and they say, does he want to um, get off or whatever? And he says, no, but he says, but I think the dog might appreciate. So the pilot offers to take his dog and of course the pilot's wearing sunglasses walks down the ramp <laughs> with a guy dog and they said they're a hell of a job trying to explain to people to get back on the plane <laughs> that's funny <laughs> you know sounds, um, sounds apocryphal but it could be <laughs> you never know do you? <laughs> you just imagine these sort of poor passengers think <laughs> this guy guy dog and a uh, pilot appearing but um but anyway so um anyway yeah go from the sublime to the ridiculous um so so what are you working on at the moment other than growing uh, a beard and it's it's really weird chatting to you because as i said you just look so different <laughs> to me um i say you look very you look very much like the captain of the ship it suits you um, thank you thank you um what am i working on at the moment uh i've just been i've just submitted a paper. I finally submitted this paper, which has been in my out tray for about 20 years. Um, <laughs> sort of trying to pull together all the evidence for and against the process of domesticating the wolf, which is funny because it goes right back to where I started when I was an undergraduate student. Mm. And, um, you know, again, I'm sort of pulling in anthropological evidence and archaeological evidence and 
behavioral evidence and all the rest of it. And um, hopefully that will come out fairly soon. Where's that, where's that going on to? Uh, that's going to be in uh, Frontiers in Veterinary Medicine. It's okay. going to be in a special issue of that uh, journal Okay. Uh, um, on dogs. So are you allowed to give us a preview of your conclusions or not? Well, my, my conclusion is that um, the kind of story that uh, is very popular at the moment that the dog kind of domesticated or rather the wolf domesticated itself by um, scavenging off human hunting waste mm. uh, just doesn't hold water if you look at all the evidence. And uh, as far as I can see, the only way we could have domesticated wolves was through early pet keeping, but it just seems to me that it's impossible to get there by any other route. Um, yeah, it's a long, it's a long and complicated story. So, okay, I'm 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 fascinated by that because, um, with the uh, well, some of the data, and you're probably much, well, I'm sure you're much better read than me on it. Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Having just written the paper, definitive paper on it, yeah, um, yeah. I would hope so too. But I just wondered, looking at the evidence, how much sort of there have been failed domestications of the dog uh, mm. because they ended up in the in the pot, <laughs> or or they were just too much of a pest um, hanging around in uh, certain environments. But that I mean certainly sort of you could see there might be an advantage i'm not sure about co-hunting um well um but i was saying this to clive you know the idea that if you look at homo sapiens that they're not you know they're not the most robust um individuals and with some of their weapons you could see them injuring megafauna but how effective would they be at actually killing it off and i just wondered from sort of one of the things I've been thinking about is sort of, well, maybe, you know, they would injure something and then the, the wolves might do the, the hard work and then you can use your weapons to actually get rid of the wolves mm. because it's easier to kill a wolf with a spear than it is a mammoth, but. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think a nice possible model uh, that has been sort of historically well documented is the relationship between Australian Aborigines and dingoes. Mm. So there are endless accounts of Aborigines uh, going out, uh, finding dingo dens, removing the puppies and then bringing them back to the community, the, the, the human community. Often the puppies would actually be nursed by Aborigine women mm. uh, if the puppy were was too young to be weaned and they would grow up and be treated very much like children, like kind of members of the family uh, up to a certain point. Uh, uh, when they get to being adults, uh, they then start to compete with people for food and then they get like driven out. And most of these dingoes then go back, they kind of revert to the wild and, and sort of our reef sort of feralized, if you like. Uh, and, um, and then they become the next generation of dingoes from whom the Aborigines harvest puppies from time to time to bring back to keep as pets. So you're developing this kind of long-term uh, uh, ex extended <laughs> relationship between dingoes and wild dingoes humans and these kind of semi-wild dingoes that also are part of the whole thing. And the reason it never gets beyond that, in other words, the reason why Aborigines never re-domesticated dingoes is essentially because of the issue of competition for food, protein. Mm. And um, so you, in order to get beyond that stage of just pet keeping, but then the pets being kicked out when they get to adulthood, um, you need a, a circumstance in which there is surplus protein mm. for a fairly extended period of human history. And as interestingly enough, as a paper came out very recently, suggesting there was probably a period in uh, uh, 
Pleistocene Europe um, with a lot of megafauna around when indeed humans would have had more protein than they could have used <laughs> themselves because humans have a limited capacity to digest protein. It can only be, I think, about 20% of our caloric intake that we can actually use. Mm -hmm. um, so if you've got a ton of it around in the form of large mammals which you're hunting, uh, it's going to be more than you can make use of. And so in that circumstance, this situation, assuming the kind of situation existed that exists with the Aborigines and the dingoes at that time with people capturing wolf pups, rearing them in the family, but then kicking them out when they got older, they didn't have to kick them out anymore. In other words, there'd be enough food around uh, to maintain a sort of permanent setup. And that's what, that's the kind of barrier that you have to overcome mm. in order to have a genetically isolated population of early, you know, whatever you want to call them, wolf dogs, quasi, quasi dogs, um, for long enough that you can actually start to have the animals breeding within the community, rearing their pups within the community, um, and maintaining a separate population. But I can't see how you can get that with scavenging. It just doesn't mm. work. <laughs> so, but I mean, why dogs though? Why, why well, is it just, it had to be something or? And it was no, I think, you know, in, in some ways dogs are probably good. Wolves are probably good. So they're pre-adapted in some sense to living in a combined social group with humans. Uh, as long as you socialize them young enough and um but why so bother going uh, looking for dens of them i mean it, it's, it's sort of i'm just trying to think of the initial driver for the human to to bother going harvesting pups a t it's a total mystery in a sense but there's uh, there's sort of documented <laughs> anthropological accounts of hunting and gathering people doing just exactly that um going to dens removing pups and but, taking them back to keep as pets but in the case of the Aborigines, I mean, historically, they came with dogs anyway. So there was already a, a, an attraction to dogs. They, they, well, the Aborigines arrived in Australia before dogs did. So um, uh, it was a later migration that okay. introduced the dog. And um, then, of course, once they got there, they went feral mm. and it became a wild animal again. Mm. Um, so nobody ever says, you know, that uh, the Aborigines domesticated dingoes because they, they really mm. didn't. No. Because they never controlled their breeding. They just used to capture the pups and keep them as pets. And that gets into the whole question, well, why, why would hunter-gatherers want to keep all these pets? And um, that's the big question, really. Mm. And that gets back to the whole issue of, you know, why do we keep pets? What are we getting out of this strange relationship? Um, clearly, we're getting something out of it, but um, it, pinning down what it is we get is a is a, a fascinating story. Yeah, it takes us back to the company of animals as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, so, how much further forward have we got from 1986 then? <laughs> hey, I think we're. Yeah, we're moving forward all the time. Mm. We're kind of, and we're also kind of filling in the gaps, you know. Mm. There wasn't there wasn't nothing much out there in 1986. It was very uh unexplored. It was uh yeah, just theory rather than yeah, yeah, without the um the evidence, I guess. But um okay, well, I'm I'm looking forward to um to seeing that because as I said, it's uh, yeah, it there is a uh, there's so well it's i think it's coming to a head again you know there, there's quite strong views and uh with people having it but as you say it's important to identify what are the barriers and um then think you know okay that doesn't work um so what's the alternative yeah um but um so so why do you think people are keeping the pets then do you think i mean In, among your... hunter gatherers mm. well i mean some anthropologists have actually asked them that question and their their responses are remarkably similar to the kinds of responses you get when you ask people in our society why we mm. keep pets because it's fun we love it we enjoy it we we we, we love them we like talking about them we like interacting with them we like 
you know, finding food for them. That it's a kind of a major recreational activity that mm. humans seem to like to engage in. Um, and uh, they do fulfill a very childlike role in our society. There's no question about it. And they also fulfill a very childlike role in these hunter-gatherer societies. So they're treated like children. Uh, they're nursed, they're cared for, uh, they're looked after, they're pampered. Uh, when they die, they're treated like children that die. So they're mourned, they're buried in a special way. You know, there are all these ritual aspects to it that suggest that they're perceived to be like children. Um, even though a lot of these animals belong to species that these folks go out and hunt and kill. In fact, that's often how they acquire the babies. They kill the adult, they kill the parent um, for food, and then the, they get the baby mm -hmm. as a sort of bonus. And then the baby is taken back to the village and given to somebody to look after. So it's a, it's a very fascinating activity and very widespread and very human. I think it sort of probably goes back to uh, the earliest days of humanity, this type of behavior. Um, some people have suggested that it's to do with the fact that we are naturally um, a species that engages in a lot of allo parenting. So mm. we look after other people's babies all the time. And so we don't, um, <laughs> we're not too specific about whose babies we look after. We don't restrict our care to just our own babies. And mm. we're not very discriminating in that sense. We, you know, we're willing to care for anybody's babies. And sometimes those babies will not be members of our own species even. We'll, we'll happily give care to. There was that paper earlier this year, wasn't there, which is quite good data on the, they, they did a computer simulation, the grandmother hypothesis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, as to why um, sort of, yeah, uh, sort of, the, and they looked at the, the benefits that you got by having a grandmother involved. Yeah. Um, and basically yeah sort of the advantages of a menopause um mm -hmm. and it was yeah quite a strong effect and yeah that, that's an interesting idea that if that's been selected for then yeah potentially pet keeping comes as a byproduct of that because yeah. Yeah, it's all about that yeah caring for others and um the, the bigger community and if, and, if, and if the cost isn't too high I mean, I'm talking about an mm. evolutionary cost, the fitness mm. cost, then I don't see why it shouldn't, uh, you know, the rewards may, have, what I'm saying is the rewards, even if the rewards are quite small, mm. may, bal may balance the cost. And combine that also with the human tendency that, yeah, humans love learning the whole time. Yeah. You say it's, a, it's a great interactive toy in pre-Xbox days. Yep. <laughs> um, from, from that point of view. Uh, that's, that's that's fascinating. I, I said it's always lovely to chat to you on the, that basis, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, trying to get those uh, different views. So, um, so yeah, we're, I've, let's. Um, we've got a little bit longer. I, I know you said. Uh, yeah, I have bit. to go at um, one thirty. Okay. Um, okay. So um, so um, sea bark, and mm. fee bark. Um, mm. So, I mean, that's that's really uh, when you originally developed it, because it was well, was was it originally developed for guide dogs? Is that where it came? Because you seem to indicate earlier that it was more sort of more the more general interest that you had. Yeah, I mean, there was a, a precursor which I developed for guide dogs, um, and then I thought, well, what I really wanted something that I can apply to all dogs and not just guide dogs. And so the Seabark kind of grew out of that. Mm. It has some of the same components in it that we, we use for the guide dogs, but um, the idea was to, to sort of generalize across most dogs at mm. least. But it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's really sort of become a, a big, um, well, it's, it's been very widely embraced. Um, which is which is good that people are starting to standardize the way they're gathering uh, the the data. I think. Um, I mean, were you surprised by that, or did you did you think? Yeah, yeah. This is... I was very surprised. Um, <laughs> I guess it just um, filled a niche. Um, I um, I continue to be surprised by it because there are 
people have found uses for that instrument that I never even dreamt of. Um, when I first created it, it's really become um, quite extraordinary uh, how how much it's um, how, how how much it's been adopted and in how many different contexts it's been adopted. So it's it's now used for um, obviously for a lot of research. Mm. Um, in many many research publications that have used it now about 130, um, and then. A lot of uh, working dog organizations now use it routinely to evaluate their puppies. Um, uh, you know, people are using uh, a lot of breeders now starting to use it to follow up with people who bought their puppies to kind of evaluate how the puppy is doing in the home environment and also get feedback on how they're doing in terms of breeding animals with nice temperaments and things like that. Um, Animal shelters are starting to use it increasingly to quiz um, owners who are surrendering animals or to follow up with people who are adopting animals. So it's finding all these different uh, uh, uses out there, which really um, just, con like I say, continue to uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. surprise me a lot. Because um, that was, you know, my, my goals at the beginning were very modest. I just was interested in trying to create an instrument that I could use to evaluate the prevalence of behavioral problems in the pet dog population. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you know, we've just published a paper with Feebark. Oh, um, no. So, um, so we, we published some work with Feebark and the, the point we were trying to make um, was you know, and, and, and I just sort of, uh, yeah, it's, it's great to have the chance to chat to you because I don't want you to misunderstand either. So because of the way that it's scored mm. um, and, and you know, I, I had some concerns that some of the applications I was starting to see, I was thinking people are making assumptions here beyond what mm. you know, it, it can be. So if you had a score it, it, and, you know, this goes with a lot of questionnaires, um, if, if you've got a, um, five behaviors that make up a particular attribute, and, mm. and this is where, you know, if people are not careful, if you've got a score of um, five, mm. it could be that you've got each of those behaviors occurring at a very low level. You've got one of them occurring at a very intense level. Mm. Um, and so we, what we did with the feedback was we, we had a, a decent data set and, um, we then looked at, well, let's look at some of these um, uh, sort of risk factors or associations with different behavior scores, but let's use different cutoff points. So if we take the trait and we looked at uh, play and aggression in cats, mm. um, largely because there was an area that, um, you know, people often struggle to distinguish, are these cats playing, are they fighting, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, and it, it actually showed some really interesting things. So if you just said, well, okay, I'm going to reclassify. If the, if the animal scores anything, then I'll include, you know, I'll generate a score on a binary basis. So mm. present or absent that, and then I'll see how many of those traits it has. Mm -hmm. And we'll model the risk factors of development or the, 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 the associations with it on that basis. But then if we, if we raise that threshold and say, well, rather than it being one and above, because it's a, it's not zero, one, two, three, four, isn't it? Um, yeah. The traits are scored yeah. on. So rather than it be one and above, we say, well, it what happens if it's two and above? What happens if it's three and above? What happens if it's four and above? I, they've got to have the behavior in an extreme form and mm -hmm. then classify it. And we got some really, well, first, the first, then this was the main point we wanted to make was you get different um uh, you get different associations or you mm -hmm. at, according to where you put your threshold and yeah so people have just got to be a little bit more thoughtful when they're starting to think about it because it's if you're using one and above basically what you're trying to predict is if does this behavior occur yeah um and the more behaviors that occur, then the higher the score in that situation. Yeah. And that's telling you about the prevalence of the individual behaviors. Yeah. Um, um, whereas if you take the higher scores, you're talking about the occurrence of the more severe forms, which mm -hmm. are more likely to be the problem behaviors and you get slightly different patterns. Um, and 
you know, so th the first point was to just show how the factors will change and people have got to think very carefully about, yeah, what's their important threshold? Is it the occurrence of the behavior or is it the behavior occurring in extreme form? Because if it's in an extreme form, as I said, you, you get different factors. But it also started to give us, um, uh, because we, we put in cat scratching as one of the predictive uh, factors. Um, and we were sort of quite pleasantly surprised that, um, you know, there was a lot of richness that came in the data by looking at it at all those different thresholds of what it mm. might mean biologically, what is going on. So the factors that determine whether or not this behavior occurs, as opposed to occurring at an intense level are quite different. Mm -hmm. um, and if you haven't seen the paper, I'll have to send it to you. Yes, um, do. Because as I said, I'd, I'd like to do the same with um, sea bark if, if you haven't done it. <laughs> well, we did. Uh, we've done some work with sea bark. What's interesting is that you, these these um, behavior patterns show a kind of sigmoid distribution when you look at them probabilistically. Yeah. So, um, you know, the vast majority of animals show the behavior at some level. Mm. Um, but then it sort of flattens off to a certain point. And then when they start to score in the high range, it suddenly goes shooting up again. So there does seem to be a clear division with a lot of these, um, these measures, at least in the sea bark. I haven't looked at it in the fee bark, but it sounds like you've done yeah. that, like that. So, I mean, then, basically our point is you've got to look at, yeah, the distribution of your data before you decide where you're yeah. going to, you're going to cut it yeah absolutely and um i've made that um i've tried to stress that in many other papers because a lot of people have used it like you've like it's a linear variable and it's they're not really linear variables no. they are um it, they have this strange distribution mm. uh, but I, it, but when you think about it it's not actually strange at all it's kind of what you would expect in other words you have um you have the uh, the vast majority of animals are within a kind of a normal low range mm. and then at some point it goes above a certain threshold value and suddenly then it starts to shoot up again and it, it's a it's an interesting distribution and it's those animals at that up, upper tail that are the animals that are the real concern yeah that are showing the behavior that's really uh, something we need yeah. to worry about. Yeah, as you say, it's prevalence versus the intensity. And it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just interesting, uh, say, you say where your original interest came from, because yeah, that's exactly how I'm interested in it as well. And, um, mm. uh, and it's very happened. difficult. You know, people say, well, my dog scored this on that. You know, is that bad or good? Mm. And, <laughs> and it's very hard to say because, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's you could say well it's this you know this far above the average <laughs> mm. but is that good or bad that, that might depend on you it might depend on your dog it might depend on you know the nuances of the behavior and it's how that score is made up is as i said it could be a low level across a range of the behaviors or yeah. it could be that there's two or three behaviors you know that you know the dog is quite yeah and it indicates the dog has a real problem in that area and from a yeah. clinical point of view you know you need to focus on that specific problem and that's that's what i find quite interesting is as i said as a from a clinical point of view that i can um yeah not just looking at the summary scores it's it's the richness of the data and it is the, the downside is because it's so comprehensive it is so long but you've got the richness of the data and you can start to say okay you know yeah, this dog has a problem with this predisposition or this dog has a problem with this particular context and you treat that very differently. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, we, I mean, we use it a bit in the behavior clinic here at Penn and um, most of the time, the people who are using it are focusing on the individual item scores. They don't look at yeah. the, the, mm. the factor scores. Yeah. Because they're, you know, they're, they're doing exactly what you're doing. They're picking out where the particular problems are. Yeah, right. I, I'm conscious of time. You said you needed to get away. Um, so yep. we're just about running into it. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up now. Um, 
but thank you so much. Um, I really Pleasure. appreciate it. It's been lovely to see you, even if it's been a bit of a shock seeing you with a beard. <laughs> thinking, who am I chatting to? Um, uh, thank you for giving up the time. Really appreciate it. Um, and as I said, um, it's been so nice to a catch up with people, but also catch up with people who've been so important to me. And as I said, I sort of bumbled into this profession and um, uh, as I said, particularly, as I say, the company of animals, but a lot of the stuff you've you've done as well has been really inspirational to me personally. So thank you for all of that. And um, I hope we get a chance to meet up in person and to get you a, a beer at some point. Yeah. Um, Amen to that. Yes. Um, and you told me you're still in West Philadelphia. Um, yeah. the, the time I visited you, because um, I, I I don't know if West Philadelphia has changed, whether it's become a little less dangerous. Um, oh, yeah. Because um, it wasn't it the area that they used for the uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Didn't he come from West Philly? <laughs> you did. Um, but your, I, I came around for dinner and uh, your wife said that, uh, yeah, she'd just seen somebody shot in the street and you were just so nonplussed about it. So, yeah, it makes it an interesting place to live. And I was thinking, <laughs> hmm. I don't remember that. <laughs> So it's nice to know that you're all safe and well anyway. Oh yes. It's like um, it's like Brooklyn now. It's very safe and well. It's full of yuppies. Oh um, well, anyway, you you obviously got in there at a very good time. <laughs> all right. So it's your your magnetic effect. Thanks a lot, James. Uh, all right. Well, great talking to you, Danny. Yeah. Take care. All the bye best bye. now. Bye.